Medicine, the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that we've read this morning. We do pray that you would help us to be saturated in your word, that we would understand the sufficiency of Christ, and that because Christ is sufficient, we don't need anything else besides him. That Christ and Christ alone is our reward. He's our eternal reward. He's our inheritance. He's our everything. Show us Christ this morning, Lord, we pray. May you be exalted this morning as we look at your word. Help us to be convicted. May you search our hearts, O oh Lord, and know us, try us, and see if there's any deceitfulness in us and lead us in the way everlasting. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be open to your rebukes, to your correction, to your exhortation, to your encouragement from your word this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we've seen from verses 9 to 10 is that Christ is perfectly and absolutely sufficient for us. That he can't be improved on or upgraded in any way. There's no better version of Christ than the one we find in Scripture. No better version of Christ than the one revealed here in the book of Colossians. We saw that beautiful picture of Christ in chapter 1. That he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. Yes, he's the head of Florida Baptist Church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent. There's no better version of Christ than that. That's the perfect version of Christ. You don't get better than that. This is as best as it gets. Any other Christ that is presented other than this one is an antichrist. So Paul wants them to be assured that this Christ that I spoke about in chapter 1 is sufficient. He's all that you need. And when you know Christ for who he truly is, you can stand fully secure against the threats of false teachers. The false teachers, the kind of false teachers he warns them against in this book. See, the goal of false teachers very often is to try and convince us that the Christ that we have is not enough. That somehow there is a Christ, there is a Jesus 2.0, and you're missing out on him. The one whom you come to believe in is not enough. And the logic follows that if the Christ that you have accepted is incomplete, then you, as a Christian, who have put your faith in him, are incomplete. So that's why they're saying you have to supplement Christ. You have to add stuff to Christ. You need to have Jesus plus circumcision, or Jesus plus regulations, Jesus plus philosophies, Jesus plus good works, and so on and so forth. That's blasphemy. Jesus can't be improved on. This is the perfect Jesus that, they, that exists. No other one. You don't need anything else for your salvation except Jesus Christ and Him alone. He provides us provides for us a complete salvation that does not need to be supplemented by false man-made philosophies or false man-made psychology or false man-made tradition or any other man-made invention. He does not need to be supplemented by that. He's sufficient in himself. In him we have been filled or made 
complete, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. So when you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, you are complete. And that's, the, that's very good news for us who live in a world that is constantly seeking fulfillment and completion. Something, something other to, to just fill this void in me. The good news for us as Christians is we don't need to look any further. You found Christ, you found the end. He is sufficient. He's all that you need. Now, now that we've, we've already established that we are complete in Christ as Christians from verse 10, I'd like for us to look at three aspects of that completeness in verses 11 to 15. Three aspects of our completeness in Christ from the passages, from the verses that we were looking at. And what I want us to see is that in Christ, we have complete renewal from our old nature. And that we have complete forgiveness of sins. And that we have complete victory over Satan. Those are the three aspects of our completeness that I want us to see. That we have in Christ, we have complete renewal from our old nature in verses 11 and 12. We have complete forgiveness of sins in verse 13 and 14. And finally, we have complete victory over Satan in verse 15. So I want us to look at the first point in verses 11 and 12, that we have complete renewal from our old nature, complete renewal and cleansing from our old nature. Look at verses 11 and 12 with me. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, before I talk about the completeness of our renewal, I want, us to see, I, want us to, I want you to see how it works. There are two rites and rituals that Paul talks about in this passage that symbolize our renewal and cleansing in Christ, which is circumcision and baptism. He mentions these two rites, these rituals that were meant to symbolize our renewal and cleansing in Christ. Circumcision and baptism. One relates mainly, of course, to the Old Testament, which is circumcision, and the other mainly relates to the New Testament, which is baptism. And both these rites are symbolic. They have symbolic value. They were not special in and of themselves, but they represented glorious and spiritual realities. All right? They were not in themselves very significant in that they could save us but they pointed to something very glorious, very something related to salvation in our lives. So I want us to look at them both and see how they connect, how they relate, starting with circumcision. In verse 11, he talks about circumcision. Now, in the Old Testament, circumcision was the, was the outward demonstration that man was born sinful and needed renewal and cleansing. So the cutting of the foreskin was a very graphic, very graphic way of demonstrating that man needed to be cleansed at the deepest level of his being, which is the heart. That graphic picture of the cutting of the foreskin in circumcision was meant to point to something greater. It was meant to demonstrate that man needed to be cleansed deep within. And so it's very important that I stress that this value of circumcision was purely symbolic. It was not salvific. In other words, it did not really have any saving power. It does not save. It only symbolizes the spiritual reality of a saved person. God was using circumcision to illustrate our desperate need for renewal and cleansing in our hearts. You see, the main issue was always the heart, and that, was, that has always been God's priority. It was always the heart, not the physical right of circumcision. And if you don't believe me, let's look at the verse again. Look, look carefully what it says. The emphasis is not on the physical right of circumcision. 
Look at verse 11 again. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It was not a physical circumcision. His focus here is not a physical circumcision. It's a circumcision made without hands. So what Paul is saying here is that God's saving work in us is like circumcision, except it is made without hands. Circumcision is the picture, the symbol that points to the greater reality. In order to see it more clearly, even in the Old Testament, we see that this has, been, this has always been God's heart. It's not like God thought about it in the New Testament. Like in the Old Testament, I was just purely concerned about the circumcision of your foreskin. But in the New Testament, yeah, then we'll talk about the circumcision of the heart. Even in the Old Testament, God's priority has always been the circumcision of the heart. I'll read Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. It says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. So even in Deuteronomy, even in the Old Testament, when God gave them the law, his priority was always inward circumcision. And now in the New Testament, of course, the Apostle Paul puts it very well in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, where he says that we are the true circumcision and worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We are the true circumcision, we worship by the Spirit of Christ, we glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. Put no confidence in the physical rite, a ritual of circumcision. So I hope the point is, has been made clear that the focus here is not physical circumcision, but spiritual circumcision of the heart. And he says we did this by what? By putting off the body of the flesh. That is our sinful, fallen human nature before we were saved. Putting that off. So when we come to Christ, we receive renewal and regeneration. We, we put off the old sinful way of living and we put on Christ. Christ is put on. And so therefore with, circum with, with the circumcision of the heart comes a new way of living. A renewed heart, a circumcised heart lives in a different way. And that was God's concern. See, because in the Old Testament, the Jews could brag that, oh, well, we, we, we have the covenant of circumcision that our forefathers gave us. And yet their hearts were far from God. So now, what Paul is really saying is that in the New Testament, we have something more special, something more glorious that Christ has accomplished for us. The circumcision of the heart. He has made our hearts new. He has purified our hearts. He has renewed our hearts. So we have something better than what circumcision, the physical rite and ritual of circumcision was supposed to point to. So it's important to stress that. And now I want us to also now look at baptism and hopefully you'll see the similarities of the two rituals. You'll see the similarities between baptism and circumcision. Of course, they're not entirely parallel. We, 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 we need to be careful. We're not saying that the rite of circumcision in the Old Testament is exactly parallel to the New Testament rite of baptism. They're not exactly parallel, but there are some similarities that Paul highlights in this passage. So what does he say in verse 12? He says that, having been buried with him in baptism, in which we were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. So baptism is a picture of our union with Christ in salvation, being buried with him in baptism and raised with him in newness of life. So it symbolizes our identification with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Symbolizes it. So you can see they're both symbolic. So similar to circumcision, baptism is a symbol of a spiritual reality. It does not in and of itself save. It points to God's work in salvation. Hope that makes sense. So our union with Christ does not take place when we get baptized. It does not take place when we get baptized. Our union with Christ 
takes place when we put our faith in him. That's when our union with Christ happens. Christ unites us to himself, not through baptism, but through faith in him. Baptism only is a picture of that reality. In fact, once again, I want to point, I'll point you to the text so that you see this. Look at the text again in, in verse 12. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. How? Through faith. You see that? You were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So it was through faith, through faith that we were baptized and raised with Christ. Baptism is only a symbol of that reality. And so that is why at Florida Baptist Church, by the way, for those who've been wondering, this is why we don't baptize babies. This is one of the reasons why we don't believe in infants being baptized. Perhaps some of you have come to Florida Baptist Church, you're new, and maybe perhaps yourself, you were baptized as a baby, right? And you came into Florida Baptist Church, you've been visiting the church, and you've been noticing a trend. Seeing all these newborn babies born, and none of them is baptized. Natty and Londi have a baby, no baptism. Ruan and Belinda have a baby, no baptism. Sia has, has a baby, okay, come on, Sia. Maybe Sia will do the right thing. No baptism. What's going on? Sister Domi has a baby, no baptism. Brother Paul and Sister Ledile have a baby, no baptism happens. What's going on? This is one of the reasons why we don't baptize babies. Because babies are not, the reason is because babies are not a fit subject for baptism since they've not put their faith in Jesus Christ. So we believe that baptism is for those who are united to Christ through faith, as the text says. Through faith. Those are the proper the right subjects for baptism, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And again, salvation, baptism has no saving power. It points to the reality of our, save, of our salvation through faith. That's a significant element. So as you can see, the connection between the two rites and rituals in verses 11 and 12 is that Circumcision pointed symbolically to the need for regeneration and renewal under the Old Covenant, just as baptism points symbolically to the need for regeneration and renewal in the New Covenant. So that's how they kind of relate to each other. And that renewal is found only in Christ. In Christ and in Christ alone. He alone gives us complete regeneration, complete renewal, and complete cleansing from our old sinful nature. So in Christ, first point, Christ, we are completely renewed. We received complete renewal and cleansing from our old sinful nature. So secondly, not only does Christ give us complete renewal and cleansing from our old nature, he also gives us complete forgiveness of sin, gives us complete forgiveness from sin, complete life from the dead, and complete forgiveness of our sins. So let's look at verses 13 to 14. It says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So now Paul, he really takes us back, right? He takes us back before we were saved. He reminds us of our past spiritual condition. Do you know how he describes it? Notice how he describes our past condition before you we were saved? Dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Get this, you were not, we were not simply sick. People. We were not broken or misguided people. We were dead 
in our sin. Dead is dead. That means we were spiritually insensitive and unresponsive to the things of God just as a physical corpse is insensitive and unresponsive to its natural surroundings. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. That describes every single person before they came to Christ. So if you're here and you, you've, not, you've not come to Christ in saving faith, guess how the, the Bible describes you? Dead. You're a dead corpse. You're a dead man walking. You're a zombie. You're dead. You're a spiritual zombie. Without Christ, we were helplessly dead and could do nothing to escape it. There was nothing we could do to help our spiritual deadness, just as a physically dead person cannot do anything to get life in himself. We were dead. From the day we were born, we laid in a grave of our own making, and our hearts were incapable of responding to God. Our hearts were incapable of loving God. We were insensitive to the things of God. So Christian, if you've come to faith, you're a miracle. Oh, you're a miracle. You're a glorious miracle. You could not help yourself. You did not pull yourself up by your bootstraps and say, I believe. When someone asks you, how did you come to faith? You don't say, oh, no, I, I just decided one day to make a good decision and believe. No, 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 no. You could not. You were dead. Christ had to give you new life before you could even put your faith in him. That was our past sinful condition. Every ounce of our hope was swallowed up in sin. That's where we were. And that's what, that's what makes the following words in verse 13 all the more precious. The, the lines that follow in verse 13, oh, they become also sweet when we start to see this. Look at verse 13 once again. So it says, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, guess what happened? God made you alive. God made you alive together with Christ. That's what makes it so sweet. Because we were helpless. God had to do this. So if you're a Christian today, realize God has performed a divine surgery in you, in your life. It was necessary. You could not believe any other way. You were dead. Oh, but God, God made you alive. So if you're here today, you're a Christian, God had to speak life into you. He had to call you out from the dead. He had to say, live, come forth, come alive. Though you were dead, unresponsive to anything, nothing. Someone preaches the gospel, your, uh, your, your, your parents, your Sunday school leader, whatever. They tried. They preach the gospel. They preach the gospel. They penetrate. They try as best as they can. No response. Until God said, prudence, come alive. And you responded. You believed. That's what it took. God has made you alive. You could not do this yourself. Without God's intervention, you'd still be dead in your trespasses and sins. See, unless we recognize just how helpless we were before we came to Christ, we will never really appreciate the resurrection power of God in Jesus Christ. You've got to realize this is who you were. And God made you alive. But it doesn't stop there. There's more. He didn't just say, come forth. So you come forth, you rise from your spiritual deadness. And you're like, I believe, Lord, I believe. And guess what he does? He forgives your sins. Look at what it says at the end of verse 13. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. All our trespasses. Forgiven. And pay attention to that word, all. All your sins. Now, it's quite interesting. I, I looked it up in the Greek, and you will not believe. In the Greek, the word all means all. 
all your sins forgiven. Past, present, future sins forgiven. The sins you did and committed yesterday, the sins you committed before you came to church today, the sins you're going to commit tomorrow, the things you're going to, the sins you're going to commit next month and next year until the day you die, have been forgiven by God in Christ Jesus. Do not just forgive half of your sins. He forgave all, all of your sins. And then to, to, to illustrate this, he goes on to illustrate this forgiveness in verse 14 by saying, look at verse 14. He says, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, Paul even goes as far as speaking of our sins as a debt that we owed to God that we could never pay. He speaks about it as a debt that was heavy. We couldn't pay it back. And since, since we've all violated God's law, his legal demands, there was a certificate of debt that was filed against us in the courtroom of heaven. It stood there. And for as long as it stood there, you were charged guilty, guilty, guilty. And that certificate, it testified against us before God that we are guilty, helpless sinners. There really was just no way out here. So we were dead in our trespasses. So on the one hand, you could not even pull yourself up by your bootstraps and say, okay, no, let me try. Let me, let me really do something. You could not do that. So one, you're helplessly dead in your trespasses and sins, and because of your helplessness, you are guilty. God does not say, oh, shame, man. Like, he's, he's helpless. He can't do anything about him. Let me just spare him. Let me not punish him. No! It, our guilt stood before God. Our punishment was going to be just before God. But what does God do? He forgives us of all our trespasses, he nails it to the cross. So, and Paul says when God forgave us, he did not just sit and wait for us to try and work out a payment plan. Do you notice that? It does not say when God forgave us, he just decided, okay, you know what, look, let's, let's reason this out. Your, your, your sins are heavy. I can only forgive this, just this much. You've, you've got to do the rest. No, 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 he didn't bargain with us like that. He did not, thank God, he did not bargain with us like that. He didn't say, let's, be, let's, let's go halfway, 50-50. No, 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 no. He says, he forgave us all our sins and nailed them all to a cross. He, fought, he, fought, he offered us full and complete forgiveness. He did this by nailing it on the cross, the record of our debt that once stood against us is cancelled forever. If you're a Christian today, there aren't any outstanding sins left for God to forgive. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crim crimson stain, he washed it. Why the snow? All of it, all of it, there's nothing against you. He drove a nail through the infinite, he, he drove, God drove a nail through the infinite dead of our sins by crushing his own son on the cross. Crushing his own son, his own son. Our sins were so great that it took the death of God's own son to remove it, to remove the stain of our sins, that ought to humble us. That ought to humble us. God had to crush his only son in order to remove the stain of our guilt. You, you, we know how this is like, right? When you owe someone a great debt, just assume, let's assume you owed someone one billion rands. And you're like, you're my bank account is not balanced. I'm in debt. I'm just like one million. I, I don't have it. I don't have it. 
He says, unless you pay this one, this one, this one million rands, I'm killing you. And someone just decides, okay, you know what? Here's what I'll do. I'll sell my house, sell my car, sell all my possessions. I will do everything I can to get you out of this debt. I'll clean my bank account and pay that debt for you. When someone has done that for you, this is just, I'm just talking about money. When someone has done that, you know, you I could not pay that million rands. And someone just decides to make that kind of sacrifice. Look, I'm selling my house. I'm selling everything I have. I'm selling my car, my possession. I'm emptying my savings. I'm going into my savings. I'll empty it and pay your debt. Or you'll be humbled. You'll be so thankful. And how much more with the precious blood of Christ? Because realize... Christ did not just purchase our salvation with perishable things like silver or gold. He purchased it with his own precious blood. More precious than silver and gold which perishes. More precious than a million rands. He purchased it with his own precious spotless blood. That's what it took. And if you know that's what it took, walk in fear and trembling. Realize that this was, this cost God everything. Christ is not just, yeah, no, like a small little dead that did not matter much. This was God's own son. The very begotten son of God had to be crushed to pay for the penalty of our sins. Oh, we ought to be humbled. So we see through Christ we have received complete forgiveness of our sins. Christ gives us complete renewal of our old nature. That's what we saw first. He offers us complete forgiveness from sins by nailing them to the cross. And finally, Christ offers us complete victory over Satan. Oh, I love this one. This one. God gives us victory. Complete, not partial victory over our enemy, Satan. Look at what it says in verse 15. Verse 15, he says, He disarmed, when Christ died on the cross, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it, that is, in the cross. Now, Satan's greatest weapon, get this, Satan's greatest weapon against us was his accusations. The accusations he could bring to God against us was one of his greatest weapons against us. That's why the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. That was one of his greatest weapons. And Christ has stripped him off of that. When Christ bore our sins on the cross, he took away Satan's most dangerous, dangerous weapon that he had against us. Christ's victory on the cross stripped him. It emptied him. He had nothing. He was, he was defenseless. He had no sword anymore in this war. And here's the irony. I love this irony. Here's, here's the irony of all of this. When Christ was crucified on the cross, the human rulers and authorities like Herod and Pilate and the, the, the Jewish leaders, them and the demonic rulers that are in the heavenly places, the rulers and authorities, when, when Christ was crucified, these rulers, remember what they did to Christ? They disarmed him, they stripped him naked, they held him up to open shame. And they celebrated what they thought was a victory for them. Right? They celebrated, they mocked him. Like, oh, save yourself now. They thought they had decisively defeated him. Right? But in that very moment, instead, the death of Christ accomplished the very opposite effect. 
When Christ died on the cross, his death, it disarmed their powers, it stripped them naked, it triumphed over their forces, and it held them up to open shame. So it, it accomplished the very opposite. They thought, oh, we've got him. Oh, we've got him when we wanted him now. What's he going to do? But instead, it accomplished victory over them. Oh, that's beautiful. So in his weakest moment, in Christ's weakest moment, he disarmed the most powerful forces of evil that have ever been seen in this world. He disarmed them. He triumphed over them. He humiliated them. That's what his sacrifice did. It accomplished a complete victory over the demonic force forces. So death did not have the final say on the cross because God raised him from the dead. Death did not win. God rose him from the dead and gained victory over Satan. He crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. I like the way Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 to 16 puts it. Hebrews says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that is Jesus, likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Oh, that's beautiful. In dying, he defeated the one who had the power of death. So not only did the death of Christ conquer our sins, but it also conquered our greatest enemy, Satan. Sin and Satan were defeated in the death of Christ. And by the way, we still have a war to fight, right? We still do fight against Satan. Ephesians chapter, chapter 6 makes it clear that we don't fight against flesh and blood, we fight against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we have a war to fight, right? But the victory, the decisive victory has been won. Christ has won the decisive victory. The decisive battle has been won by Christ for us on our behalf. So Christ's victory is our victory. We triumphed with Christ through his death on the cross. Satan is defeated. So as a believer, like your completeness is really complete. When verse when, ch when chapter 2 verse 10 says, you are complete in him, that completion is really full. You have complete renewal from your old nature. You have been given a new heart, a new heart. So completely new. You have received complete forgiveness from sins. You even received complete life. Though you were dead in your trespasses, God has given you life. And that life is complete. And he has given you complete victory over Satan. You don't need to be fighting and sweating. I bind you, Satan. I, I, I bind the devil and pray all night. Oh, in the name of Jesus, any spirit that is against me, I bind thee. No, no, you don't have to do that. The victory is won. It's settled. Christ has won it on the cross. So that's what we celebrate, even as we celebrate communion this morning. Realize that what this symbolizes is complete renewal and cleansing from sin, complete forgiveness, complete victory over Satan. We would not have this unless all that, Christ, all that Paul mentions about Christ here in this passage took place. We would not even be celebrating communion. And so even as we 
partake of communion this morning. Let's celebrate this victory that we have gained in Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Christ. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for renewing us, Lord, for giving us complete renewal and cleansing us from our former sinful nature. Thank you for giving us new life by your spirit, though you were dead in our trespasses and sins. Thank you for completely forgiving us of all our sins. And thank you for our victory over Satan. That even as we wage war against Satan, we know that the outcome is secure. We know that we will endure until the end. That nothing will ever separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus. Thank you, O Lord, and I pray that you would comfort us with these truths, that your word would help us to walk in step, in sync with our new identity. Help us, O God, and may we celebrate your victory as we come to the Lord's table. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This table is open to all believers, everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus for eternal salvation, for eternal life with God, for the forgiveness of sins, if your trust is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this table is, is open to you. But if that does not describe you, if you know in your heart that you are not a Christian, that you have no living and intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus, then I would encourage you not to eat and drink from this table this morning. Eating and drinking would bring judgment upon your life. This is a serious table. This is a serious and a solemn occasion. But please don't leave. Rather use this time as an opportunity to think about the things that you have heard uh, this, uh, this morning and what you see. Uh, the, the bread that symbolizes the, the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ which, which suffered on behalf of sinners and the, 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 the wine, the cup, symbolizes his blood which was poured out on behalf of sins. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23. These are the words of the Apostle Paul as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And this is what I would encourage you to do. Verse 28. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I will now ask us to pray and give thanks for. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, and I thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for us, who suffered a horrible death for us. Father, let us remember that your body is broken, and that we can remember all that you must be this moment. I thank you in Jesus' name for learning us, for saving us. Amen. Please hold on to the bread until we have all received and we will eat together. Again, we read of the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together in remembrance of Heaven will pray and give thanks for the company. Oh Lord and Savior, as we come to the table, let us remember that very special day. 
day that you sacrificed your son on our behalf. Lord, as we take the cup, we think of the suffering that he endured, both physically and, Lord, spiritually, as he was cut off from you. We pray for you. And we just thank you, Lord, for this table of remembrance that you are able to enjoy. Amen. In a similar way, please hold on to the cup until we have all received and we will drink together as a body. Again, we read, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ and in anticipation of his coming kingdom. Lord, we thank you so much for your kindness to us this morning. We thank you for your life giving word the gospel, the good news. Thank you for what it accomplishes within us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who causes us to receive and to embrace this good news. Lord, we thank you for having sent your one and only Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for willingly coming into this world of sin going to a cross and dying in agony, bearing upon yourself our penalty. You have loved us to the end. Thank you for rising again on the third day, uniting us to yourself, causing us to be born again to a living hope through your resurrection from Oh, we praise you, O oh Lord, for your kindness. You have given many things to us. There is not one thing that you have withheld from us that is good. Forgive us for our ungratefulness, our grumbling, our complaining, our discontent. 
Help us this coming week to be people that are known for their contentment, people that are fulfilled in you, people that are satisfied with you. Help us to drink deeply from that fountain of living waters. As the hymn writer says, O oh Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love, the streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I will drink of. Help us, Lord, to be grounded this coming week. We renew our commitment to you this morning. Help us to be faithful. Help us to not indulge in the desires of the flesh. Help us to cling to your promises. Oh, you have been so faithful. May your faithfulness to us be a great encouragement for us. May you spur us on this coming week. We pray for other members who are not able to be with us this morning, O oh Lord. We pray that you would console them and encourage them this morning as well. That you would strengthen their souls, that you would preserve them to the end. Thank you for this one. Pray that you would bless us all, even now as we Sing our last hymn. Pray that our hearts will sing heartily to you. That you would receive our worship, our adoration, and our praise of you. We do pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, we'll sing our last hymn for the morning. Let's sing together. Let's sing heartily to the Lord, to the honor and the glory of his name. Yes. 
Our benediction will be taken from 1 Timothy chapter 6, from verse 15 to 16. It says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Stay blessed and let us stay behind for fellowship and get to know each other.